So welcome, welcome to everyone today. A particular welcome to those of you who, for whom this is your first CSA conference, and also to all the old friends in the room who have been around for many, many of the conferences. I'm Cheryl Doss, I'm in the Department of International Development here, and one of the organizers of the conference, and I wanna just take a couple minutes. Um, first, to thank the admin team um, who are around and you have all emailed with or seen, um, particularly Rose Page, Wendy Yates, Julia Coffey, Suzanne George, and Richard Payne, who have done much of the hard work of getting this all together. Um, this year, we had 1,172 submissions, um, and we've got, we had 335 paper, papers that were accepted. A few have dropped out since then, um, and there's 445 participants these few days here at the conference. Let me also say a special thanks to all of you who served as referees. As you can imagine, it was quite a challenge to sort through the 1,172 papers and figure out which ones we wanted to have um, presented. There are both student volunteers and some of the admin staff who are wearing Whatever these things are called, there's our red. <laughs> so if you've got a question or you're stuck or you need information, those are the people to ask. And if they don't know the answer, which some of I'm seeing some of them looking quite nervous, um, if they don't know the answer, they'll know how to find out the answer. So if you've got questions, ask some of those folks. Um, the lecture, at, this lecture and the other things going on in this room for the, these three days are all being live streamed. So if you've got people who want to be joining but couldn't be here, they're, they're welcome for the ones in this, in this room. So I think that's all of the announcements and welcome. Um, so we'll turn it over to the panel. And so let me introduce Stefan Durkan, who's the director of CSAE. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, thank you um, for being here. It's uh, always great every year to actually see so many familiar faces, including some that I probably in the last 31 years or maybe fewer that you've been coming. Uh, I still don't quite know your names, and, uh, but it's always uh, great to see so many people um, and such a, a wealth of uh, papers and uh, issues to discuss and, and to, to so I, I, may I just point out the first row is also allowed to be sit, sat on, so <laughs> people try very hard not to sit on it. Excellent, I like that. Um, so we have, a, we have a session here uh, this evening, the first plenary session. So usually we have a number of sessions where we try to actually touch on, um, on research that is um, maybe a bit different, um, that maybe makes you think, um, and that's also on topics of big public policy uh, relevance. Now, uh, we're going to do a session on African refugees and migrants. And Look, the issue of refugees and migrants has skyrocketed to the uh, agenda uh, in so many countries, not least in Europe and in the US. Um, the influx of migrants, uh, probably with a new, big impetus given through the Syrian conflict, but also then the lack of, um, lack of stability and the breakdown of, of uh, almost anything in Libya opened up lots of routes into Europe with migration. And this also involved quite a lot of African migrants um, that ended up crossing into Europe. Uh, popular sentiment in, oh well, our own country here and many countries where you come from has definitely turned against um, a lot what has to do with, with migrants and refugees. Um, we have populist parties fighting elections uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, places and um, people with limited brain power becoming presidents of the US. Um, um, the but it's actually, it's not just in Europe and in the US that the topic is sensitive, it's also in Africa sensitive. It's something that is not, we should not just take for granted as if it's just something about uh, our countries only, where there's a lot of issues to do with refugees and migrants inside Africa as well, um, some more welcome than others. 
um, anti-migrant sentiment, for example, in South Africa is being a very striking feature in recent times. Um, while, you know, take Kenya, the issue of Somalian refugees is incredibly sensitive and indeed regularly, again, for political reasons, will get announcement that everybody will be sent very quickly. Now, with conflict rife in Africa, uh, this is not going to stop very quickly. With also big heterogeneity in the economic progress inside Africa, the idea of migrant and people, migrants and people wanting to move to different places is not going to go away. This is not something that just happens to be an issue now. This is a big issue, but it's an issue also that needs much more and deeper understanding. So we have a session here, and, and for me, I have a couple of objectives here, what we want to achieve, and that's at least what I told the speakers. Um, to get a good idea about you know, issues to do with the economics of refugees and migrants uh, in Africa and also in the routes into Europe. Um, what do we know about smuggling routes? What do we know about um, uh, the livelihoods of refugees? What do we know about the way uh, African migrants integrate in labor markets in Africa or, or in Europe? Um, it's important that we get the facts right, that we get some good research going, and actually there is really still a huge amount of work to be done in that area, I think. Um, it would be good to get some sense of what some of the questions are, and I've definitely asked the panel to reflect on some of the things that actually we haven't really been looking much at. And then finally, of course, it's a public policy issue, and good public policy will start with a good grasp of the evidence and the facts. So hopefully we'll hear some things today that makes you change a little bit your mind on things. I don't think that there's anyone here in this room who has uh, the same prejudices as uh, some may have in the political landscape, but it's still so that when I had to start looking at some of the issues and some of the, the stylized facts, I've been surprised and I hope you'll be surprised as well. We have wonderful panelists who have worked one way or another around this topic. Um, I'm going to introduce you in the order they will speak, but I'll do the introduction in one go now. Uh, so we'll first have uh, Philip uh, Verwimp. He's at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. Uh, he's an Associate Professor of Development Economics at uh, ULB where he's a fellow of ECAR, the European Centre for Advanced Research in Economics and Statistics. And his research is on the micro-level analysis of violence and conflict. Uh, he analyzed the causes of violent conflict and its effect on health and nutrition, trust, social behavior, and forced displacement. He has worked extensively in Central Africa and is leading a program at the moment on longitudinal data uh, and impact evaluation in Burundi. Okay. The next speaker will be Tuesday Retano. She's from the Global Initiative uh, Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, she's the deputy director there. And it's actually, you know, look up their website, global, globalinitiative.net. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, place and uh, a source of lots of interesting stylized facts that you probably never knew about. She's a senior research advisor also at the Institute of Security Studies in Pretoria, where she leads five organized crime observatories in Africa. She was formerly um, in the UN system, including with the UN Development Program, UNDP, uh, and other groups within the UN, including the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Um, she's the lead author of a forthcoming uh, OECD flagship publication, uh, Illicit Financial Flows, Criminal Economies in West Africa, and she's written an excellent book. I'm sure she'll talk a bit about it. I think it's really worth reading. Uh, it gets you a whole series of uh, good analysis and perspectives on the role of smugglers in Europe's migration uh, crisis. And then finally, we have from Oxford here, Isabel Ruiz. Um, from, uh, she's an official fellow uh, and tutor in economics at Harris Manchester College. Um, she's just come out of a heavy teaching term, as probably many of you. Um, she's also one of the coordinators of the Economics of Forced Migration project. Uh, and she was one of the researchers of the labor market impacts of forced migration project that the DFID funded uh, with, the, with ISA. Um, she's also one of the researchers in the economic, in a project on the economic integration of refugees uh, funded by the Nuffield Foundation. These are people that work on aspects of this and I will invite them each to speak for about 10, 15 minutes and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for some good question and some, uh, some robust debate maybe on some issues as well. So, uh, Philip, may I uh, ask you to um, introduce your talk?
All right, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here. I have termed my uh, presentations Africans on the Move, in which I'm going <laughs> to tell a story in, in three stages. Now, it's not necessary that everybody goes to these three stages, but it's a way to, to present uh, the work. So first stage is for me voluntary migration. I consider a typical individual household in its day-to-day -day activities. People make choices, which crops to grow, how to earn an income, whom to marry, where to reside. Voluntary migration is one of such choices. As economists, we believe that people maximize their welfare. Well, migration is one of the choices they can make to maximize their welfare. Of course, within a specific institutional context, but it is an integral part of daily life in Africa to make such choices. And we have quite some evidence on the drivers of voluntary migration. In Kenya, in Malawi, in Tanzania, we have evidence on land scarcity, population density, and soil quality driving people to more fertile areas, from rural to rural migration. We have environmental risks more broadly. People from dry land and mountainous ecosystems move away to coastal regions for better livelihoods, rural to urban migration. We have lack of non-farm opportunities as one of the key driving economic forces in Uganda, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, migration to secondary towns and cities. We know also that migration is often endogenous to household formation in South Africa and in Burundi. In a very interesting paper at this conference, Garlic et al. find that 80% of black South African households have either sent or welcomed a new household member, births excluded, over the period of just a few years. So migration is a perversive issue in the whole of Africa. Reasons to voluntarily migrate from the parental household in the Burundian panel data tell us that marriage is one of the key issues to leave the parental household for young adults at one moment in time. Where do they go? Well, many of them stay in their village of origin, in their municipality of origin, but about one third to one quarter move out of that village of origin and very often at the time of marriage. So household decisions, migration and household formation are key to this problematic. Beagle et al. in Tanzania, through a, through a migrant tracking data over 30 years, find that migration results in a 36% point increase in consumption growth relative to remaining in one's community, a huge increase. In the Kagera region of Tanzania, where poverty fell by about 28% over 19 years, almost half of the decline could be attributed to farmers either transitioning into rural or non-farm economy or migrating to secondary cities. Christiansen, one of the authors, calls this a missing middle because secondary towns are often overlooked when we talk about these migration issues at the, as they are centers of structural transformation. The welfare implications of migration in the Burundian panel are also very high. Households who were splitting the original household had a one-third increase in consumption, whereas the newly formed households have even a 56% increase in their consumption compared to households who did not split over time. The poor in Burundi are less likely to migrate, but if they do, they are more likely to escape from poverty. From this, we should question what should be our unit of analysis. Is it the individual migrant? Is it the sending household? Is it the receiving household? The newly formed household, the extended house of the community, again in Garlic's paper, gives us um, room for thinking about this because she finds large welfare gains for the individual migrant, but welfare losses for the receiving <coughs> household in the South African setting. So migration may be beneficial, but not for everybody who's concerned by it. Hence, the evidence on voluntary migration shows that it's driven by the search for new and better opportunities, that migration is very often correlated with changes in household competition and endogenous to household formation. Then we arrive at the second stage, when misfortune can strike the household, they have to flee. They are forcibly displaced. A household and an individual is leaving its habitat under the threat of violence, insecurity, or disaster. It can no longer use its land, livestock, and local networks to sustain or improve welfare. In Sub-Saharan Africa, this is mostly an IDP issue, much less a refugee issue. You know, there's the legal distinction between the two. The IDP issue is almost double the problematic of refugees. So Africa, we're mainly talking about IDPs. 
The relative importance of it is that the share of refugees originating from Sub-Saharan Africa represents about 30% of refugees worldwide, with IDPs leading the refugees within Sub-Saharan Africa, and they are more numerous than the refugees crossing the continental border. In 2014, developing countries hosted over 86% of the world's refugees, giving us a bit to think in Europe that we think we are overburdened with refugees. <coughs> The last couple of years, it's specifically Eastern Africa that is the main hotspot in terms of the origin, and it contrasts very strongly with about 20 years ago. It has to do also, of course, with the variability in weather shocks, documented in my stats work. More than elsewhere also, refugees in Eastern Africa are hosted in camps. And camps, of course, are a particular setting in, in which one, one's choices are more constrained than, than when we live elsewhere. Apparently, there is something about Eastern Africa that most of the refugees and IDPs are hosted in, in camps. The same tank conflicts have caused the majority of forced displacement every year since 1991. That should make us think. That should make us think that solving these conflicts would at the same time reduce enormously the amount of refugees and IDPs, as the same tank countries are responsible for the majority of forced displacement. During displacement, forcibly displaced persons are not only victims, of course, they are purposeful actors. They flee in response to threats, sometimes at gunpoint, often not. In the midst of conflict, they must choose whether to stay or to flee. In this sense, one has to be careful by labeling this behavior as forced, because, of course, people do make choices. Some stay behind, some flee. These decisions are incredibly difficult, often made under duress and with imperfect information. With violence and poverty widespread, both staying and fleeing carry very high risks. People have to assess and compare the odds of survival under each of these scenarios. The World Bank estimates that 80 to 90 percent of the population in conflict-affected countries does not flee, Syria being the exception. Some people or groups may be particularly targeted by violence, particularly at risk of to be targeted. Economic concerns and social networks can also determine who stays, who leaves, and where people go. Those who have opportunities far away because they believe their skills or their social network may are more likely to flee than those who have strong ties to their land and cannot sell their assets. Welfare implications of violence in a panel of Burundian households, you can see that when you're struck by violence, your consumption declines. And household splitting is, in fact, a coping strategy to prevent your collapsing consumption. Lessons from three can case studies which I've done with, uh, with Jean-Francois Mainstadt in a, in a World Bank uh, research policy paper, we find that market mechanisms are often not discussed when we talk about refugee settings. And we talk about security without giving food, without giving health. But what about the entrepreneurial activity of, 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 of refugees? It's almost not discussed. The, the importance of local public goods, such as roads, education, and health services are also very important because they can ease the acceptance of the local population for the, the refugee in, influx. Uh, if local population sees that re infrastructure is being built and that they can benefit from it, they will be more likely to, to accept the population, also because that infrastructure stays there when the refugee crisis is over, or at least to, to a large extent. We do have, however, little information about the efficiency of particular interventions to promote successful local integrations. And this is, of course, a task for us, development economists, to do more work on what works in refugee settings. Refugees as entrepreneurs, by Alexander Bates from, Bates from uh, Oxford universities, also writes that policymakers have not actually adequately captured the nature of economic activities displayed by refugees. As a result, agencies and policymakers have failed to tap into the economic potential of refugees. And of course, this is bad for the refugees because they are seen as benefiting from all kinds of allocations by the state, whereas making them more active would also ease the, uh, the, the uh, acceptation by the local population. In his work, he documents what he calls refugee economies in Uganda, Congo, Rwanda, Somalia, and South Sudan, that these refugees are incredibly entrepreneurial in their day-to-day -day activities. There are long-term implications to refugee crisis. Few studies, however, have followed children exposed to forced displacement over a long time to directly infer the long-term effect of forced displacement, in particular on health, education, and labor market participation. Most studies of the long-term effects of conflict use an indicator of exposure to violent conflict, but few of them have forced displacements as one of the indicators. 
There is a, a nice literature review in Curry and Vogel in 2003. And then there is the last stage. The displaced household is contemplating whether to return or not to the place of origin. Of course, that decision is also a very difficult one because they may find their habitat completely changed. It's no longer the same. Neighbors may have taken their land. Their house may be destroyed. Trust relations are different. Their livestock may be killed and stolen. Maybe one of their neighbors has, has killed one of their family members. That, that's the reality of, of, of Africa today. And that's contemplating the making much more difficult the return decision. So should they return or not? Well, that is also about the uncertainty of the status of being a refugee. Some countries never award full rights of citizenship to refugees. So that could be a reason to return home. It could also be the changing circumstances in the country of origin. A new government may empower, may be more likely to accept former refugees. But we shouldn't forget about the subjective reasons that they also play a role, such as nostalgia, the feeling not being at home in the, country, in the host country, being a feeling of discriminated on the labor market, or wanting one's offspring to be raised in one's home country. These are very crucial questions to contemplate for, for, the, for the former refugees, should they return home or not. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Please. Hi, good evening, everybody. I apologize in advance if I'm a little bit sniffy. I have a stinking cold, which didn't result in the sexy Marlena Dietrich's voice that I've always wanted, but instead with goldfish eyes and a very sore throat. So apologies for that. Um, I'm here to talk about the political economy of human smuggling in Africa. Um, the work that we have been doing at the Global Initiative has been to study illicit economies as a political economy enterprise, rather as a business, one that is embedded in its local context. One of the things that we have seen, I think, over the course of the migration crisis in the last few years is the extent to which human smugglers have proven an extraordinary vector in human movement. I mean, few would have expected that a refugee crisis prompted by the movements of Syrians would have resulted with incredible rapidity in an extraordinary number of citizens coming from all over sub-Saharan and North Africa, but also from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and further afield. Human smugglers have now established tentacles across the globe, which they reverberate to build and amplify human movement. They are, I think, an essential part now of the study of human migration, which perhaps they were undervalued for before. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the study of human smuggling is that it's pinned down very quickly as being a crime. It is, as probably many of you know, a tra officially a transnational organized crime under the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, also known as UNTOC or the Palermo, Palermo Protocol, and it has a dedicated protocol to it. Yet all of the way that human smuggling is embodied in this exercise is as a criminal enterprise run by vicious transnational networks, those nefarious enterprises who we can all sit together and quite happily demonize as being the bad guys in any story. In fact, what we see instead is that human smuggling is a service industry. And it's a service industry that runs along a spectrum. Yes, there are unquestionably the worst of the human smugglers whose behavior is to move people involuntarily or aggressively with extreme amounts of violence, with debt bondage and other forms of very discriminatory and uh, practices violating the human rights of those that they move. But actually, in the majority of cases, and global ethnographic studies have shown this, human smuggling is a very benign industry. It's one which is a part of a resilient strategy, as Philip very much described, for people moving all over the world. It is fundamentally a service offered to people when they cannot move themselves. They, it, it is something that responds to the level of need. We are very specific in saying, while the formal definition of the crime is the irregular crossing or the illegal crossing of borders and the victim is the state. In fact, what you see in human smuggling is that smugglers are used to cross all kinds of borders or barriers or obstacles or challenges. You know, where there is a vast geography that one cannot chart by themselves, a sea or the desert, the Sahara being a prime example, smugglers are needed to help people cross over that territory. 
where there is a large differential between language, for example, or culture, where a particular ethnic group is persecuted in, another, in a foreign territory, they use a smuggler to secure their journey. So often for the migrant, the smuggler is a lifesaver. It's, it's a valve. It's a safety valve. It's a resilience mechanism. It's a protection. And it is one that is needed on a sliding scale. So the easier it is to manage the journey for yourself, the less you need a smuggler. If you take, for example, within the 15 states of the ECOWAS region in West Africa, smuggling is essentially the price of a little bit more than the price of a bus ticket. All you get from your smuggler there is a little bit of local knowledge and a phone number to call when you reach the edges of those zones. Smuggling is a low, en low violence, low profit enterprise. By contrast, if you look at the Horn of Africa, and Philip's uh, points very much on profiling the Horn of Africa uh, were, are very pertinent, are that this is an established, professional, and highly criminalized industry which cleaves very closely to the state. It's worth noting, for example, that whereas in West Africa, as I said, smuggling is not lucrative, in the Horn of Africa, migrants can play as much to get out of the borders of their own countries as they would do then for the much vaunted route to Europe. We're talking here in prices in the thousands of dollars. So in this context then, if, if um, to, and, and you're an uh, economist, so I feel good using this example, this is an industry driven by supply and demand, and both supply and demand curves can shift. It is worth, as always, I think, using granularity in your analysis, putting it in a local context, and understanding that policy can change the way that those dynamics work. And what we've seen very regrettably in the course of the last three years is the tendency to see human smuggling as a crime, smugglers as nefarious and predatory, has resulted in a highly militarized set of policies that raise the barriers for migration, in the process often criminalizing the migrant as much as it does the smuggler. But consequentially, they end up growing the industry that they're trying to break down. So it's a very ironic policy cycle, which in fact we really need to, I think, disabuse and turn around if we're to see this vector move back towards being its more benign state. What is interesting is that when human smuggling is functioning in a way the way that it should, it is an industry built around a number of safeguards. I mean, if you think for a migrant, what they're entrusting a human smuggler with is their lives, and they care about them. And that fundamentally, in the majority of contexts, human smugglers have very little to distinguish themselves from another human smuggler, the one down the block. They have essentially two things. They have price and they have trust. So. Price, you can fluctuate the price, but as I'll explain later, there are reasons not for not doing so. But then you use trust. And what you see in human smuggling now is that it runs along ethnic lines, because people trust people that they know, that they understand, that they can speak to, that they feel familiar and comfortable with. So you see migrants and smugglers moving with people who are very similar to themselves. You know, in, in the majority of sub-Saharan Africa, in Africa, your smuggler is somebody from your community, at least at the first point of contact. And somebody who might be referred to as auntie or uncle, brother or cousin. And smugglers will always refer to their clients in that way too. And they very much emphasize how reliable they are, how trustworthy they are, how they can get you to your final destination. I've sat down and spoken with smugglers across Africa and in the Middle East, and they will always pull out their smartphone and play you the WhatsApp messages of their grateful clients. They will show you all of the referrals that they have from other people. They, in fact, are far more beholden on their good reputation than they are on the money that they make. In this, this question of safeguards, there's a balance of power. And what we see very much is that there's a spectrum here as well, that the way that a migrant is treated by its, their smugglers and the experiences that they'll have along their migration journey depend on their balances of power. So the Syrian refugees who have moved in the last few years had, I think, unprecedented levels of influence and control over their migration journeys. While, yes, we heard a lot of stories of exploitation, at the same time, we saw genuine innovations in protecting the way that they moved. They were able to negotiate with their smugglers for in customized journeys, for reduced numbers of people in trucks or in boats. They were able to put into place what we called migrant escrow schemes, often guaranteed by quite sophisticated things like QR codes and other kinds of deposits by which money was held by a third party and released in stages so that they were very safe along the way. 
And that bargaining power came over the fact that, first of all, of course, they had a far higher level of disposable income than the average sub-Saharan African. Just before the war in Syria, the GDP per capita was around $1,250 a head in Syria, whereas in most African economies it's under $300 but also because they were reinforced by knowing that there are two to three million other Syrian displaced, all of whom may be well looking for another journey. So there they had that power against their smugglers. But by contrast, what you see in sub-Saharan Africa is far less of that influence over their smuggling journey. So where Syrians could hold their money with trusted third parties, migrants from, say, West Africa moving through Niger and then up to Libya through the Sahel, they will pay all of their money in advance, by which point they then lose their agency over their journey and they're vulnerable to their smugglers. The payment is made along the way and they have very little control of that. As a consequence, they are subject in general to a higher level of risk in terms of human trafficking, human smuggling or brief periods of forced labour or abuse. Even more extreme now is what we've seen emerging, and this parallels examples in the Americas, of a in the Horn of Africa of a travel now, pay later scheme, where in fact no money is put down by the migrant in advance of their journey, and then they're, held, they're subject to being held in periods of bonded labor or other kinds of vulnerabilities along their way. So even if you look at the way that the market functions and the individual transactions that are being negotiated, you can see how much there this balance can be affected and how much risk is then put on the migrant in that process. <coughs> That said, though, I think, again, Philip's example was very pertinent in showing that human migration, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is a win-win activity. And while you may see this balance of power being a question and the smugglers being in control, in actual fun fact, in many ways, they are the ones who bear the greatest risks. I mean, everything that we've seen in the study of migration, as very ably demonstrated, the individual migrant, no matter how high the cost, and at the peaks of this migration crisis, we've seen you know, $10,000 being paid for air journeys, three, four $4,000 regularly paid for any, any individual journey from sub-Saharan Africa through to Europe, but then still several hundred dollars just to move around within their regions. Why is that money worth it? Well, because you see it, generational returns, as Philip's example showed you, from the movement. The diaspora who are financing often, or the communities who are financing, will see that benefit come back no matter how much it may seem to be outlaid at the beginning. In this context then, in actual fact, neither the price nor the physical risk that migrants are much vaunted as having experienced in their journey serve as much of a deterrent. We have seen in the media a lot of stories around you know, exploitation, torture camps, kidnapping, um, extortion, sexual abuse, rape. But Actually, these are known quantities for the average migrant in sub-Saharan Africa. They, they probably underestimate or are prepared to risk that level of abuse at the beginning of their journeys. Because fundamentally, and I've heard this from migrants themselves, it's not that different from what they might experience at home. When you're talking about people who are moving in a forced displacement situation, or you're talking about people moving from countries where regimes are authoritarian, author, author, blah, 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 <laughs> authoritarian and punitive, you know, if you read the testimonies of people from military service in Eritrea, for example, the way that they're treated by their commanding officers is not so different from the, what you hear from the, the way they're treated by their smugglers along their journey. In fact, in some cases, it's better. So if, if price is not a deterrent, if risk is not a deterrent, then what is stopping any of these people movement, moving in, in actual fact? And this is why I think fundamentally human smugglers are a very important part of their local um, economy. And what I think is very interesting is actually in, in, the, in this discussion, the risk to the smuggler is greater than the risk to the migrant. First of all, in financial terms, they outlay the costs of their journey often before it's made. If money is being held by a third party or is not released or is released in stages, the smuggler nonetheless has to make all of the pay payments to arrange the transportation before they go. Often they have to actually buy the migrants from other brokers, so that they, and they do not get paid until the end. Second of all, of course, they are the ones who have to deal with the risk of arrest, of, to manage the costs of corruption, and to deal with, with the punitive <coughs> consequences if they are found to have contravened a local law or fallen on the wrong side of state officials.
And the point that I wanted to really emphasize here is the extent to which human migration and human smuggling are state-enabled enterprises. You cannot underestimate at the purest level the extent to which corruption, like many illicit industries, is imperative to grease the wheels of the journey. You know, particularly as you see the crime rise in prominence, the higher and the more risky the journey, the higher the costs of corruption. So whether this is money being paid to an individual border guard or an individual police officer or a member of uh, the immigration team at an airport to turn the other way, those costs rise when the political stakes are, are, are higher. Similarly, however, though, often these are the, the rationale for people's movement is something that is triggered by the state. And it is the policies of the state that make a human smuggler necessary. So in states with very harsh border control policies, smuggling becomes even more essential. And in those countries with the highest and most punitive border control policies, the only people who could serve as a human smuggler in that context is either in or part of the state or extremely close to it. So it is not to suggest in any way that this is an illicit industry that is being marginalized from mainstream society or that it is something a state agents and actors necessarily want to see the end of. It's worth noting, for example, that in a lot of the Saharan smuggling routes, there is an established tithe and a bribe paid per car and sometimes per head on every migrant that passes through. Those four by four convoys that were leaving from Agadez and heading towards Libya famously went with a military escort. There was a um, report of the National Anti-Corruption Agency that could actually table the established number of bribes, the, the established rate of bribes that were played first to the military police, then to the civilian police, and then to the border control officials on every single journey. Older studies show that the largest source of fraudulent <coughs> visas and false documentation are from embassy officials themselves. And that what is even more interesting, in fact, is that for the, this night Nigerian convoy, if they were not getting the revenues from the human smuggling trains, they wouldn't be able to afford the petrol needed to run their cars. They're actually relying on the tax, corruption tax that, the, that they are taking from illicit trade to run their basic operations. So these are state enterprises that are a functioning part of the economy and society. There are implications, of course, in painting the picture the way that we do. Um, that understanding the way that any illicit industry runs is fundamentally, it's not a question necessarily of economy, but also of politics. Illicit economies are political. What is considered to be legal or illegal is defined by the law, which is, an, uh, is arbitrate, arbitrated by the state. So, but what we see that is um, perhaps pertinent is that often those who... Those who move have a reason for moving that is also in relationship to the state. Often they are those who are seeing the products of marginalization, the inequitable distribution of resources, the inequitable distribution of security, of development opportunities, of social or political rights. They are the marginalized. But smugglers are often the same. They are far more in identity and um, ethnography similar to the migrants that they move than they are to legitimate society. Those who have cleaved towards illicit trade and illicit enterprise are often those similarly who have been excluded from legitimate enterprise, from earning livelihoods under viable industries, whether that's an intentional policy of the state or simply a question of geography. So when you have this context where a migrant is more similar to the smuggler than to the state, where illicit economies and the movement of people and the people that they move is inherently political, there's an enormous implication for your policy responses. You, we have seen the profits of human smuggling become the next cocaine trade in, uh, across sub-Saharan and North Africa. These have been such profitable industries that have played in to the priorities of the groups who are able to control them. And those profits are then reinvested in either establishing and consolidating control of their industries or reinforcing their ability to control certain te territories and to be able to establish a protection economy around that. The question then is recognizing this is a, 
not the ideal way for anybody to move. That often the consequences are increased levels of criminality, increased levels of violence, generally considered unacceptable or undesirable in the context of development. What happens if you close them down? We've sat with smugglers in various places and we've said, well, you know, if, if, the, if the Europeans managed to end the smuggling trade, what would be the implications for you? We know that the implications for migrants in general would be dire. The ability to move in sub-Saharan Africa is a fundamental resilience capacity. It is the ability to recover and avoid economic and social shocks, but it is also a fundamental input into their development and future potential. But for a smuggler, often that's the livelihood that they have. And when we asked in Agadez in northern Niger, a smuggler, a smuggler of the Tuaregs, what would you do if you couldn't smuggle anymore? His response was, well, we'd go back to what we were doing before, making war and kidnapping white people. <laughs> so I think the question here in demonizing the human smuggling trade and in using these very punitive and repressive policies to end it, do we end up with a problem more severe than we had before? Fundamentally, in every case, human smuggling, human migration is a safety valve, it is an input, and it is often an important one into the economies and the politics of individual domestic environments. And every country, it has its electorate that it has to answer to. So when you push countries like Niger to consider ending human smuggling, closing down that political economy, the impact could be profound. Three, four years ago, I was going to every European capital trying to explain the nexus between organized crime and terror in the Sahel, and that was everybody's biggest policy priority. Now that and, the, and that, and the risk that it provides has been cast aside because we're worried about the influx of migrants into Europe. And there's a very interesting juxtaposition here on, first of all, the fickleness of European policy, <laughs> but also I think the credible and long-term impact and the, and the level of analysis that we put into play when we're looking at the illicit economy and those who act in it. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Stefan, and everybody at the panel uh, for inviting me to this very interesting panel. I'm going to give a different perspective, and basically what I'm going to, uh, to talk about is about what is to be a refugee in Europe, uh, what happens when you make it to Europe, and I will basically concentrate on the case of the UK, uh, and this is part of a, a research project called the Economic Integration of Refugees in the UK that recently started, and it's called or with Carlos Vargas Silva, who's he sitting here in the audience, um, and we're looking at economic integrations of, of refugees in the UK, but particularly what I'm going to show today is in terms of labor markets. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, the background and, and, and start sort of making some sense of what would be the reasons why um, there's labor market differences between refugees and economic migrants uh, in advanced economies, and then I'll focus on the case of the UK. Uh, stress the importance of Africa as a, source, as a source region of asylum, and I'll give you some of the evidence that we've found so far uh, from the survey of new refugees, uh, uh, new refugees and the labor force survey. Um, and again, I wanted to just start thinking and, 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 and to try to make some sense of what would make the, uh, labor market, what would explain labor market differences between refugees and migrants. And one of the main reasons is there's different motivations to migrate, right? There's differences in self-selection. Uh, economic migrants are more likely to be uh, choosing the host economy in terms of uh, characteristics that lead them to succeed in, in labor market outcomes. But they're also more likely to have experience, refugees are more likely to have experienced traumatic events um, that affect their mental and physical health and therefore the ability to work. And we've heard here about the, the, the experiences in smuggling. So they, they, they had traumatic experience not only pre-migration, but during migration and after migration. Uh, but, an in, but, but an important thing about this is also that asylum seekers face legal restrictions to access the labor market when their claim is being evaluated. So when they make it, for example, to the UK, they, they cannot work until their, the decision uh, on their refugee uh, brand has been made. 
And there's been some evidence that periods of labor market inactivity can have negative long-term consequences uh, in terms of uh, labor market integration. Uh, just to give you an idea of the minimum waiting periods for, access, for accessing the labor market for asylum seekers in, 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 in Europe, you can see that in Greece, uh, an asylum seeker can enter the labor market straight away. But in the UK, for example, you have to, you have to wait up to 12 months if, you're, if the decision on your asylum claim has not reached, it has not been evaluated. So after 12 months, you're able to apply for permission to work. And if granted, you can only work on certain occupations. So it's not like you can join the labor market like a refugee would do, but you can only work on certain occupations that are within the shortest list uh, of, of vacancies. Um, so for obvious reasons, they're also unable to produce evidence of previous qualifications. And there's geographic and network externalities. Uh, these are related to dispersal programs. In the UK, for example, asylum seekers um, are provided with housing and um, weekly allowance. Uh, and when they're provided with housing, they, they're sent to different places in the UK, and they don't get a choice. But they can opt out of, of, of this housing. Uh, but this can have this can have a consequence on the way they join uh, the la la labor markets. But there's also the fact that there's lower probability of return. If you think about refugees in developing countries, uh, there's been some evidence that because the probability of return is lower, they're more likely to be settled permanently. Uh, they're more likely to invest in specific human capital and then eventually possibly catch up with other migrants. Um, so this is uh, the number of asylum applications in the UK. And I just wanted to show you the relevance or, of Africa as a source region. So uh, the number of asylum applications from Africa are between 35 and 45% of, of the total applications. Uh, but as you can see here also, there's been a big decrease. Uh, after 2002, there was a big decrease in the number of asylum applications in the UK. and and and. The, the, the reason I wanted to show you this is because uh, the applications filed, the asylum applications filed, they do respond to waves of conflicts around the world, but also respond to things that are done at the host country, like uh, the decisions they make in terms of, of, of policy. And for example, in here, you see a big drop in the number of asylum applications after there were border controls in France. Uh, this was part of an agreement between France, the UK, and Belgium. And you see also uh, after the border controls in Belgium uh, were started, there is also some decrease. So I'm, I'm here, I'm not uh, claiming any causality, but you see the correlation in the drop of asylum applications. Uh, then you see also how there's a, a, a relative increase in the number of applications when the Syria conflict started. And, and you can also see how the share of the African, uh, of African nationals as a total of the asylum applications has been lower uh, after the Syrian conflict. Uh, this is uh, just to show you some of uh, application, uh, the applications from key African countries. So as you can see, Somalia and Zimbabwe have been uh, some of the main uh, countries of asylum application, and Eritrea has been taking more relevance in the last few years. Uh, there's also the DRC and Sudan on the top countries of, of um, asylum seeking. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit of what we've done with the survey of new, refugee sur uh, of new refugees and the labor force survey. And the, the survey of new refugees is um, <coughs> a questionnaire. Uh, it, it's an interview that included a sample of those granted protections in the UK between uh, 2005 and 2007. So these were refugees that were interviewed one week after the protection was granted, so after they became officially refugees, and they were follow, followed up, there were follow-ups 8, 15, and 21 months after the positive decision. 53% of them came from Africa. So we have complete information for about 1,500 uh, refugees in the first follow-up, but 729 in all three rounds. Um, so I, I'll just show you some of the descriptives here for the ones that we can follow over uh, the month. But you can see that um, over time, of 20 months after they being been granted uh, the, the refugee status, there is an increase in the likelihood to be unemployed. Uh, there's a decrease in the likelihood of being unemployed. And there's a, a slight decrease on the, on the likelihood of being in a high-skilled job. But this is mainly because those that 
that uh, enter into, the, uh, into employment were more likely to go into low or medium skilled jobs. So the other data set that, that we've looked at is the labor force survey. And what's interesting about this is that in 2010, they started asking people about the main mot motive for migration. They wanted to know why they had come to the UK. So the, the interesting thing about this is when we can look at, 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 the, at those that choose asylum seeking, uh, is that we're not necessarily looking at those that have been granted uh, refugee status, but we can also look at those that are still uh, claiming asylum or those that could have been denied the, the, the application of asylum, or those that could even be British citizens, but were um, refugees at some point. Uh, so we look at individuals of working age who entered the UK on or before 2006. And you can see here, this is all the uh, migrants from the LFS, and we have them by the main reason for coming to the UK. And as you can see, the main motive for coming to the UK for migrants is uh, for family reasons, and there's about 6% of those that came seeking asylum. Um, just some descriptive statistics, uh, one of the things that you can see is that refugees in general um, fare relatively worse than non-refugee migrants in terms of employment, in terms of weekly earnings, hourly salaries, and hours worked. Uh, and also you can see that uh, apart from hourly salary, uh, refugee women tend to fare worse than refugee men or non-refugee women. Uh, so, in, and in here I'm going to just show you some of the regressions uh, that we've done so far. Uh, this is the labor market outcomes and, and then we have, we have control for everything you can think of, individual characteristics, local area and so, and so on. And as you can see, uh, in the first column, we compare <laughs> refugees versus all the other migrants. And as you can see, refugees are um, nine percentage points less likely to be in employment, and they, they have weekly earnings that are 32% lower, 21% uh, lower hourly, work, uh, hourly salary, and uh, they, they work less than uh, the, the migrant counterparts. And you can see the same uh, happens uh, when you look at women, refugee versus um, refugee um, women migrant and men re and refugee men and other um, migrant men. We also compare the refugees with economic migrants. Economic migrants are those that chose uh, looking for a job as the main motive to coming to the US. And we look at family migrants and accession migrants. Accession migrants are those that um, come from, the, um, from countries uh, that got access to the, U, um, to the EU in 2004. And, um, and the UK one was one of three countries that give unrestricted access to the labor market. And therefore, uh, there was a big wave of migration from those countries. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to point out here, because in general, you can see that in all the, uh, in all the labor market um, outcomes that we look at, refugees first worse off, is that if you look at economic migrants, there's a big, big difference between refugees and uh, economic migrants, specifically in weekly earnings. So we've looked at other things. We've looked at uh, things like convergence over time. We've found so far only convergence in terms of the in-employment in dummy. Uh, and thinking about the channels, because we wanted, we wanted to start thinking about what, what, are, what could be explaining these differences. We so far have found significant health gaps between refugees and others, uh, including health conditions limiting work, and a negative uh, effect of time waiting for asylum decision. This is, uh, this is something we're still working on because we're still trying to figure out the way of best um, measuring this time, um, th this type of waiting. And uh, we're, we're currently also looking at other things such as well-being and, um, and human capital. Uh, but in general, I think there's lots of questions still to be answered uh, in, in this literature. And the main, the main um, I guess the main problem that we as economists in academia have is to find the, the best data sets to be able to, to look at, at, at these different outcomes of refugee migrants in the UK. Thank you. Chris, um, we have time for um, well half an hour of uh, discussion and questions. I mean, we had uh, got a bit of a 
a sense of um, migratory experience in Africa and uh, decision making, a bit on human smuggling markets, and uh, there I say, um, surely there will be a few sessions next uh, year to properly formally model some of these stylized facts because it's quite a something that I definitely didn't know much about, and, uh, and experiences in labour markets of refugees when they get to the UK. So, just looking for hands, I expect there's a microphone. There's a microphone, very good. Um, yeah, let's gather a few questions, and maybe if you could say who you are and also to whom you want to direct a question. Hi, my name is uh, Fadi Sam from Trinity College Dublin, and I have a couple of questions for Tuesday. And one question is about the Syrian versus uh, sub-Saharan African migrant. So you mentioned that they were able to arrange better, better deals with the, with the smugglers. And uh, I wonder how much do you think also the cultural proximity maybe between the smugglers of, you know, Syrian with the Turkish smugglers, for instance, helps vis-a-vis -vis a sub-Saharan smuggler and, 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 and a Libyan smuggler. And, and the other general question, and, and it's something that I, I still don't know and I haven't understand, why cannot a, a migrant, an asylum seeker, ask for asylum in an embassy of a country where he is? Is it an international law constraint? Is it a national law constraint? Where, where does this come from? I'll take the yeah, here one, and then I'll go to the back. Hello. I'm I'm Joseph Atkweka from uh, Tanzania. Um, well, my question is uh, for the, uh, the first speaker. Um, and uh, my question is about actually getting the issues of refugee and migrants in context. Because uh, the way the presentation was done, it indicates that uh, maybe there's a refugee crisis uh, in Tanzania, which is not uh, true. So, um, but, but um, perhaps it's worthwhile distinguishing between the refugee problem of the host country, because Tanzania will have a, big, a huge problem of being the host country for a lot of uh, refugee. And my question here is whether the ongoing research actually um, is focusing on uh, the economics of refugee from that point of view of the host country. I understand that a lot of development agencies are also thinking of programs to make refugee more productive, like giving them uh, some money so that they can transact it domestically and sort of have a multiplier effect. Uh, thank you. And that would distinguish from the domestic rural urban migration, which is a completely different problem. Thank you. And we have one at the back there. Let's do that there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Tadeb Kilcham. I'm with the World Bank. Uh, very quick question uh, on this uh, corroboration between state actors and smugglers. Uh, I think uh, your account from the, the, the Horn of Africa, the, the West African, the Libyan setting maybe, I can't, maybe it was Nigerian, uh, from that Sub-Saharan African setting, uh, it was very interesting uh, and it reminded me a dynamic of my own home country, which is Turkey. Um, government of Turkey right now is contemplating a massive uh, entry into citizenship on the part of Syrian uh, refugees. And, uh, and they, they see this as, a, as an electoral strategy um, for them to be able to basically stay in power. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any particular insights into the corroboration between state actors and uh, human smugglers on the border of Syria and Turkey, um, and, and how uh, in terms of the local dynamics vis-a-vis -vis the national dynamics, um, those corroborations actually um, work out. Thanks. Okay, so I think that's enough questions to start with. Um, Philip, you want to come first? Yes, sir. Um, I'll address the, the question. Um, I think you'll agree with me that there's a lot of migration of Tanzanians in Tanzania, uh, which is a completely normal, normal activity. Um, I agree with you that at the moment there's no uh, refugee crisis in, in Tanzania of people coming to Tanzania. There was one 10, 15 years ago with a large influx of Burundians and, and Rwandese uh, refugees, uh, of which um, Jean-François Maestat and myself, we, we worked on that a lot, and we found in Kagera, so where a lot of the influx uh, took place, uh, kind of small cities developed. Uh, and, and there we find 
we used um, Tanzanian data and we found a small negative impact on the low skill Tanzanians. Uh, because, of course, the Rwandese, the Burundese, they were competing for the same kind of, of, of low skill jobs. And we find also positive effects on local entrepreneurs, even flocking in from Dar es Salaam and from Arusha, because they would build up the infrastructure, they would help the NGOs. So you have very distributional effects of the impact of, of refugees on host economies, maybe in zero or a little bit negative for the low skilled and positive for high skilled and for entrepreneurs. Thank you for three super questions, um, two from the same person. Um, to answer the easy one, why people can't seek asylum in an embassy, it's because the states choose it that way. Uh, for European states, the Dublin regulation actually specifies that you can't seek asylum until you're within the borders of the state in question and you are forced to seek asylum in the first state that you enter. So they are literally saying you have to enter illegally in order to seek asylum. But that is by choice. Uh, other countries have different policies. For example, in Australia, you can, Australians can seek asylum in uh, local embassies, but others choose not to do that. Um, Syrians versus Sub-Saharan Africans, they got better deals fundamentally because they had more money and they were prepared to spend more money on their journey because they were traveling with their families. They wanted greater safety. It, it's very rare on the whole in Sub-Saharan Africa for an African family to travel on famille and look for a journey in that way. So they, they were a very different profile of mover fundamentally and they had more money and they were moving generally in a one-way journey. There was very little sense that the Syrians who were leaving the neighboring countries of Syria to come to Europe were, had any reasonable fra time frame for planning to return back to Syria. Most were considering this would be a permanent move. So in part because then the de where they chose to seek asylum was incredibly important because you get the benefits of the place where you land so they, they had to land and be registered in the right place in order to seek asylum. So the, dyna the dynamics are very different. The Syrians distorted the market also for sub-Saharan Africa. To speak specifically to Syria and Turkey, I do actually have a policy paper on smuggling between Turkey and on the Turkish border and smuggling, human <coughs> smuggling in Turkey. I mean, it's, it is very political, like everything in Turkey. And there are different smuggling markets depending on the locality, particularly on the Syrian-Turkish border around Gaziantep. It plays into all of the local insecurities, the local power struggles. There is increasingly the very heavy pre prevalence of Turkish organized crime. And as we know, Turkish organized crime does have its proximity to the state also. So. I mean, we see it as a destabilizing factor, not as a stabilizing factor. And I think all of the risks there and the efforts to try and meet the requirements of the EU-Turkey deal are not facilitating national stability in any way, and they're pushing secure, a very securitized approach to migration um, that, it, that is problematic. To take the question, though, of course, around nationalization, as I think Isabel's example showed very clearly, the more rights a, a, a migrant or a refugee has in its host state, the better it's likely to fare and the more productive it is for the local economy. But I would say in Turkey, and the fact that, we, that it's now hosting over two million refugees, I mean, so far, those who have been granted even right to work is in the, I think it's only 2,800 or something like that. So you're talking an infinitesimally small prop portion of that population. And I mean, the average estimate now on the cost of hosting that refugee problem, population in Turkey by the government's own estimates is some 500 million a month. So I mean it's mind-blowing how much money is being spent but then at the same time there is still a very active cross-border trade even though now the border between Turkey and Syria is largely closed and double fenced and landmined with regular military patrols people are still moving across and goods are still moving across and if you look at some of the economic activity indicators the cross-border trade is more vibrant now than it was three years ago. New companies are being opened along the Turkish border to Syria with a transportation cross-border as their mandate. So, I mean, it's a very interesting dynamic. I wouldn't say, frankly, that I wouldn't have expected that the promising greater rights to Syrian refugees in Turkey would have helped them politically, particularly. But I would say that thumbing a nose back at the Europeans might do so more effectively. Okay, some more questions? Okay, let's go to that side, maybe. 
Hello, so I'm Joseph Gomez, and my question is for Isabel. Uh, do we know anything about why migrants want to move to certain countries within Europe? Why is there so many people waiting in Calais to pass over to, to the UK? Is it entirely because of family ties, language? Is life actually a lot better in the UK? Is that what, what, why do people want to move? And also when you showed the graph about differences in laxness about how, which countries it takes longer to get a, the right to work after moving, is that a reflection of more migrants trying to move to the UK and that's why they reacted and said that, well, we want to stop it, that's why we'll make it harder for them? Or do we know something about what explains that variation? Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Almeida, yes. Next to you, Kim. Uh, thanks. Uh, I just wondered about oh, Alamaya from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I just wondered about whether there are historical uh, incidents similar to uh, these recent uh, f uh, phenomena. Uh, is the current one very unique? If it's unique, in what sense? Are there lessons to be learned from how uh, historically uh, similar movements of people were addressed? Uh, are some of these uh, solutions uh, still feasible uh, and uh, uh, similar, similar uh, uh, context? Thanks. Okay, thank you. We can take one more. I think there was uh, some questions towards the front here. We can start, and then we'll get a second next round. Right. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, panel discussion. So, um, you know, um, I just wonder if, uh, I mean, my question is to uh, uh, on the panel. So I just wonder if you can uh, say something about, say, what do you think is the best uh, cause of action, you know, by the government in terms of policy advice, uh, in terms of action? Because, say, um, you know, given the increasing, you know, influx of migrants, should, say, government, uh, should a more richer country, you know, try to adopt a more PMT approach and try to, I don't know, like, uh, recalibrate, you know, the aid structure, you know, the foreign aid structure, right? So that's, say, now, a richer country, you know, invest more in poorer country or, you know, increasing, you know, the aid amount. Right, so that to create, you know, better conditions, you know, like uh, in developing country. I don't know. I mean, that you know, some hypothesis. So, can you please comment? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Shall we take this? Uh, yeah. So, so I, I, in terms of what explains how migrants choose uh, countries, uh, family networks, or uh, or the existence of connationals tends to be one of the, the 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 main explanations of how they end up trying to reach a certain country. And, and in terms of, of what explains variations of, about of the policies that, that countries adopt, in the UK, for example, there's been this fear of creating a pool factor if there's too many things granted to asylum seekers. So, so the, the reason of moving uh, from the 2005 to, to, uh, uh, to a, a waiting of 12 months was precisely to sort of, in a way, deter um, people coming for precisely that reason. Um, even recently, so there, there was a, a change in policy in that asylum, uh, asylum seekers or refugees, rather, uh, after five years, they could apply for leave to remain permanently, and that's been changed. Um, it, it's been changed so that they now have to, their case has to be reviewed again, and then they can decide whether they eventually can, can um, apply for, for leave to remain. But that comes from sort of a, a fear of having pull factors. Okay, so um, maybe a, f a few uh, replies. Um, well, the, the best policy, well, it's, that's, a, that's a tough one. So you know that the legal ways to migrate uh, to Europe are, are limited. Eh? Basically, you, have, you can come to Europe for study, for marriage, eh? to, to rejoin your family. And through a small portal, you can come to, to work if you have the right skills. But so a lot of the potential migrants, they are forced in the asylum uh, instruments. And they're not necessarily looking for polit political asylum, but they have to, because that's the only way, or for them, the only way to come into. So more legal instruments to allow genuine migrants to come to Europe would, in fact, diminish maybe the migrant stream. But because of the absence of, of, of legal ways to migrate, 
migrants are forced into the political channel. Yeah, I think that, that seems to be one of, one of the problems Europe is facing today. And then are there historical precedents? Well, most of the studies are on the US, right? Because the US has taken in over time a lot of refugees. And the, the studies we have in the literature is often on the labor market uh, consequences, either for the refugees themselves or for the local populations or for the migrant populations. So we, we lack a lot of studies on, on, on developing countries. And if you mean precedence to, to the, the wave Europe gets today, uh, that's, you know, we, we have to find the right data to study that. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Isabel has done this, this, this survey for that. But what we actually should be doing is to use administrative databases. You know, we as economists have not been really good at using administrative databases. We are very good at doing our household surveys. But what about administrative databases? Of course, it has to come from both sides. The government has to be interested in this kind of research and has to be made these data available. But administrative data are, for, according to me, the way forward, uh, because then you don't have just 1,500, which is already a lot, I, I agree. But you could have, let's say, uh, 20, 30,000 uh, observations in your data, and you could follow people over time. I remarked there that in, you see that in your data, 50% of the, of, the, of the refugees had a job after two years. So I saw recent evidence of a colleague of mine of the Université Libre de Bruxelles. He finds that 50% of the refugees who got the asylum after four years had a job. So maybe the UK is a bit faster in, in the labor market, maybe a bit more dynamic, but the percentage going in, in the same direction, which, which should, should ease is our worry that they're all going to be dependent on, on, on welfare and on allocations. If you, if you allow them to work, you know, two, three years down the line, half of them have found a job, both in the UK as well as in Belgium. These are some of the recent evidence that, that, that we have. All right, thank you. Um, first of all, surges in human movement are not unprecedented, and I think there is actually far more study than than maybe is realized and certainly when we first started looking at the rising levels of migration across the Mediterranean there were a lot of academics who were like you know hair flip pff, we've seen this before it's the same thing that we saw in the Canary Islands 10 years ago this is business as usual and clearly what I, but it isn't I mean it isn't business as usual as usual I think for two reasons firstly because overall the policies towards arresting irregular movement have been either deterrent-based, as Isabel described, or they've simply been the building of walls and borders. And the problem is now we've basically built walls and borders along every possible border we can, and we have been left with the failing states who have no capacity to monitor their own borders. So the Spanish have invested you know, two, two decades worth of development, cooperation, and assistance with the government of Mauritania which, by the way, has a shoot-to-kill policy on its land borders and uh, not far dissimilar on its sea borders to prevent West Africans migrating through the Canary Islands route. But when you get to the government of Libya, you can see that is not <laughs> what we're going to be able to do. So when we've, we, we've built our walls, we're now at the point where the dike, the dike or the dam is bursting on the most vulnerable point. So until we can stabilize everywhere, which we obviously can't, we have this point of enormous vulnerability. But I think the also the second thing here, which has been unprecedented, is the speed at which communication allows people to take advantage of these opportunities. So even in 2011 and 12, before the migration crisis really kicked off for us in Europe, we were doing local perception surveys in the Gambia and already hearing about the back door to Europe. So news travels fast these days in a way that it didn't just a few years ago. And I think on the second point, which is what, what is the best policy? Yes, more legal instruments are obviously ideal. And I think that the answer comes in partly the question that was to Isabel, which is why do people move to certain places in the EU? They move along familial ties. They move along where, where they will be, have an easy integration. And it's very clear from all of the source country surveys and people in transit, why are you, where are you trying to get to and why? I'm going there to be with my family or my uncle or whoever's paid for me to come. So I would say that it's not a question necessarily of aid budgets, because those are obviously diminishing, and they're infinitesimally small compared to the size of remittances. I would say one of the innovations in the areas where you could get very positive returns on migration policy would be around <coughs> diaspora sponsorship schemes, where you've essentially put the trust and the compact, the social compact into the hands of diasporas. 
And what has been very interesting in our recent research is talking to some of the diaspora communities in Europe, they're currently overwhelmed by the influx now. So we are seeing diaspora communities who had sponsored and helped people to come, now seeing that their structure, their infrastructure, both physical, social, and economic, is under strain from the vast number of people. It's more than they can tolerate. So day wages are going down. The acceptance of the host communities to that ethnicity in the community is, is reducing. They are being treated with hostility and suspicion. So their own deal now is being compromised. Second of all, of course, in this sort of commoditization of migration that we've seen with human smuggling, is that the diaspora footing the bill for the kind of extortion and kidnappings and additional payments that are being demanded. So no, things are clearly not working for anybody here. And if we're going to revise the way that migration is looked at completely and welcome new and legal routes, I don't think it's a question of doing what we've done in the past. Thanks. Okay, now let's do another round. There were some questions here. Moritz there, and then we'll come to Albert. Yes, uh, Moritz Paul from the University of Oxford. Uh, my question is primarily to Philip, but I'm sure the other two panelists can <coughs> contribute. Um, if we move away from the unitary household as a decision maker uh, and ask ourselves who actually makes these decisions within a household, um, we've got two parents. There's uh, in, in a traditional household two parents. We've got children, uh, all having kind of different uh, motives. We know that female refugees fare differently from male refugees in their destination countries. We've got motives like um, nostalgia that you were mentioning, uh, but also integration into uh, the destination countries. Maybe you could expand on that. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Albert Zufak, World Bank. Uh, I got two comments and, uh, and a quick question. The first comment is uh, building on a point Philip uh, uh, mentioned in his presentation, uh, which is that you know, most of the migration in Africa is actually within the continent. So when we're hearing about the migration crisis, most of us are asking which crisis, because that's what we, we've been living under for, for some time. But, but crisis or no crisis, I think we should all follow Larry Sommer's advice, never to, to, to lose a crisis, you know, never to waste it. And, and, and let's probably use this as a way to focus on the conditions in, in the uh, countries of origin. You know, I haven't heard that much about jobs here in this discussion. I haven't heard of, you know, uh, what kind of uh, uh, transformation would have to take place in countries for these flows either within Africa or outside of Africa to be resolved. Can we actually really look at what it would take? What is the link between uh, you know, receiving countries, especially on the European side, uh, the link between geo trade policies and immigration flows? Can we actually start looking at those and asking those questions as to what would have to happen in countries of origin in Africa to solve this question? Second comment. I was quite you know, intrigued by the presentation on, on uh, smuggling. And I was wondering if uh, this is not one of these cases where too much emphasis would actually you know, take us away from the problem. To me, it sounds like you know, criminalizing smuggling and making it the solution to immigration would be akin to posting prayers in schools in reaction to gun violence in schools, and actually this happened in, in a country I won't name. But, 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 you know, can we actually see smuggling as being the solution? I mean, stopping smuggling as the solution to immigration, I don't think that would certainly be one of those. And the question, listening to uh, Tuesday, I thought she was implying that, you know, um, you know, the demand is, I mean, the supply of immigrants is actually non-elastic to risk and probably non-elastic to price. But I'm not sure about the second relationship. You know, have we actually looked at the price difference between smuggling and obtaining a visa from an embassy in some countries in Africa? I'm not sure it would be that different. So it's possible that actually uh, you know, people, including refugees or, or immigrants, are actually economic agents. Thank you. Uh, there's a question at the very back. I was waiting for a while to the left. My name. I'm Jacob, Jacob Nunu from Ghana. Um, uh, listening to the presentation, I felt that 
um, the scenario that was narrated in the case of Syria was far Excuse better. Excuse me, could you speak up a little bit more? We can't quite hear you. Okay, uh, I'm Jacob Nunu from Ghana. Um, I'm talking about the Syrian case that was narrated. Uh, it looks like what was narrated looks far better from what we heard in the news as to people going through troubles just to get to Europe. Um, what is really the case? Is it that people were too organized in coming to Europe, as you said, or uh, just a handful of people had that good um, pass to get to Europe and a chunk of them went through that trouble that we saw in the news? And then my second side, is, the second question is about um, what part does uh, brain drain plays in all this discussion that we had, we are having. Uh, because in Africa, uh, you find out that even though people who are not uh, lettered do travel, many of the people who migrate are not the unlettered. They are really the, the, the people who have the know-how, the highly skilled individuals. And the case of America, where people get green card, is a typical example where they are taking people who are te technically inclined to get to America and into other places, um, getting getting in there. So, what what part does it play in all this discussion? Okay. So there's one more there. Why don't we take this now? Because we're getting close to. Anyone who still wants to ask a question, let's let's take them all in. Uh, now, okay, that's the last one there. Yes, please. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, my question goes to Isabel. Um, it's, I think the main question in all these analysis, um, looking like on similar questions as you do, is the differentiation, the correct differentiation between an asylum seeker and an economic migrant, because like those people have an interest in claiming to be an asylum seeker. And so I just wondered how you deal with that, because your economic migrant number might be way um, underestimated. And so this is a question that relates to all those studies following up. So how do you plan to kind of take account of this bias? Okay, and there was one more question here, and let's take it then. Niklas Hoysch from UPF. Uh, I'm wondering if what the empirical evidence on refugees or migrants um, responses to these push or pull factors are. Basically, are governments right when you delay entry into the labor market because you fear you're being overrun by refugees if you don't? Or is this just is this an unfounded fear? Yeah. How, how responsive are refugees to uh, these push and pull factors? Okay, good. So I'm going to ask you each to say something. This is also the last and your closing remarks for the session. Yeah. So, Philip, do you want to start? start in the well, the, a lot of questions are, I think, venues for, for new research. Yeah? So, at least for the application of, of, of the collective model of, of household decision making on migration issues, it would clearly be, be an innovation. And we have papers in the literature on how these models are applied to the expenses for, for child related goods or who decides about durable investments. And, and these collective models are, are, are very much um, putting the unitary model in question. I have not seen any, anything in the literature about applying these models to migration decisions. So that would be a a really innovation. I think it will not be so easy to do eh, because, of course, uh, we had to look inside the box of household decision making, maybe by doing separate interviews between the man and the spouse, see where they agree. Do they agree on the destination to go? Do they agree when to move? And is, is only the man temporarily moving and, and then the woman coming later? And so, so I think you, you, could, you could innovate this kind of field by, by applying these, these models. Uh, on, on the question, wh what kind of structural transformation or policy changes we would like to see? Of course, that's 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 a crucial question. For me, they they link or they make the the definition of voluntary migration and forced displacement the kind of blurred. And because imagine, for example, that you you can attribute your joblessness not to your skills, but to the fact that you have a certain ethnicity, and that it's much more difficult to find a job because of your ethnicity. When you then want to migrate, are you then voluntary migrating or are you forced to migrate? Right? That, that clearly makes it clear how difficult that decision is. You're stuck in a certain policy environment. Um, 
not finding a job is not uh, is not the reason to get asylum in Europe. Yeah, but that but you know that you're not getting the job because of your ethnicity. So in fact, you're a political refugee or migrant. And so this is the conundrum which many Africans, young Africans, face today. And how should the policy the environment change? I, you know, that's definitely a, a very long, a long question. I, I think we should have a drink about that uh, after the, the panel. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so to the question of how to deal with uh, this uh, self-identification, basically, uh, because it, people might be saying that they came for asylum seeking or of, of finding a job. Uh, in, in what we're doing, we're trying to find different ways in which we can assign probabilities to, to the respondent to, to, to see whether they're refugees or not. Uh, but that's, that's, that's a concern, obviously, that remains. Uh, as to whether how responsive are refugees to these, these changes in, in, in um, limits to how to get to work, uh, I, I don't have a, a, a good answer for that. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it seems to be mostly from the host country perspective, sort of this idea of, especially, especially in the UK, it's been mo much more of a trying to prevent this to be a pull factor. Uh, whether there's evidence for that, I don't think there's really that much evidence that, that being more lax in allowing people to work much earlier would really act as a pull factor. Um, but that has to be empirically <coughs> looked at. Tuesday. Thanks a lot. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Of course, you can't expect <laughs> to stop smuggling, and stopping smuggling isn't the answer to addressing migration. Um, in fact, I would say the goal of counter-smuggling policy should not be to stop smuggling, but to reduce it to its most benign form. So where we've seen now the development of very sophisticated and very longitudinally integrated networks that move people on a conveyor belt where the migrant is commoditized and has very little bargaining power against their smuggler, what you need to do is return to the fact where it's more community-based, where the safeguards are in place to protect the migrant on their journey. Um, and, th and that it functions in the way that it should do as a safety and release valve. I mean, I don't think in... Africa as a whole, sub-Saharan Africa in particular, stopping people moving is ever a goal. I mean, ECOWAS, freedom of movement was a fundamental part of their treaty. It is supposedly so in East Africa too, though they obviously haven't moved as far in economic integration. So I would say what we have seen though is the criminalization of movement and the desire to keep people to the extent possible as close to wherever they had originally come from as possible. And the risk is, in this Horn of Africa problem, is that these stagnant populations of people, protracted refugee situations for generations, are, neg are positive for no one. They really aren't. And they create in a political heat that is centered on this mass of people who are unproductive, who are a burden on society, who are potentially a threat, who might be terrorists. You know, the us and them mentality that comes in domestic politics when you have this protracted, I mean, unsightly population, you see it the world over. So I think our policy, policy makers should not be looking to establish and pen people in, but actually create as many options for human movement as you can and in as safely as you can, with as many resources dedicated towards productive development than to the cost of the journey. So I would say West Africa, better model than East Africa. Um, and in just to briefly look at this question here of what is the unit of decision making? I mean, what we've seen in the journeys is that you have this macro environment which influences the extent to which people are taking journeys around, or taking decisions around migration. But oddly enough, the decision one day to to move, it can be surprisingly whimsical. I mean, it, it was a, well, I, something died, somebody died, I lost my job, or a friend of mine had a, a, had a shipment of shoe, you know, flour that they were going to take to wherever, and I decided to jump in the truck with him. I mean, it's uh, this oddly micro, uh, you know, generally whimsicality of that trigger, the catalyst that actually starts a journey in places where mobility and the sense of mobility and the propensity to be mobile is very high. I mean, there, Gallup does an enormous number of surveys on intention, you know, international intent or the intent to move, and it's high. It's extremely high in Africa. So if that opportunity presents itself for one reason or another, then 
it is taken often without the forethought and the strategic decision making and the discussion with your wife or your parents or your children that you would think would go behind an international move. Um, oh, and sorry, you're, you're right. In, in, I would say that, again, on, on inelasticity and elasticity of demand for irregular movement, it very much depends. I mean, smugglers tailor their services on what people can afford, and that different communities have a different elasticity of demand for irregular movement. So refugees, perhaps, are more inelastic than the average economic migrant, but they will go the journey that their money will take them, and the industry will adapt to provide. Thanks. All right, thank you. So I'm going to hear wrap up. I mean, I, for me, um, I definitely, there were lots of points here that uh, I think are worth, worth mentioning. I just want to say a few things, and you know, some of you know that I happen to still work inside the UK government, and what I'm saying is definitely not their, uh, their view. Um, I mean, it is, it is one of these striking things that um, People will move, and they will keep on moving in, say, in search of economic opportunities and, and in search of safety. And I think what Philip has been describing, you know, it's just, you know, look, for us as economists, it's often self-evident to think like that. But it is still very crucial that you keep on thinking about it, even in, in a whole series of things. People will go and will try to uh, look for these things. If people ask, oh, can we make a distinction between refugee and migrant, you know, Deep down, it's extremely hard to make these distinctions. You know, you are driven with multiple objectives. Even yesterday, I had a conversation, I will definitely not name the name, who came to ask my advice whether it was better for, for this person now to ask for asylum or whether they should just, just look for a job anyway and try to go the other route. You know, these are areas where it's, not, it's so easy legally to make a definition, it's so hard in practice to actually do things because people look for opportunities and they also look for safety. Um, I loved it uh, to be, to have described, you know, that a human trafficking that is demonized and criminalized and seen by some as the thing that needs to be repressed. But actually, you know, as economists, we'll understand, we just see it as a service industry that has a, has a, has a play in it. You know, look, <laughs> we meet lots of uh, players in the service industry are quite awful and quite and close to criminal. Um, and of course, if we criminalize them, then it's like this. I remember the first time I heard some of the stylist facts of, of uh, Tuesday um, in, in government meetings in the UK to actually think, well, you know, the way we see the smuggling industry suddenly developing, it's a, there's so much, so much parallels to the travel industry and to the airline industry. So where, um, where you got, you know, at some point, you know, everybody's moving around, but hey, why not actually there's economies of scale here, and then inventing business class and economy, where the Syrians were going business class and, uh, and others were going in economy, where you start getting at the pricing models. If you start looking at these numbers, they are very much the price discrimination that those, those few of you that flew here business class will uh, know that uh, paid uh, far more. Uh, but then also that you do get it developed once the scale of that industry is, is, is big enough. You'll get the monarchs of the world emerging where there were people, uh, basically the collectors of uh, getting a boat full of people and, and so on. These are simple things we, we, we can think about. You know, the, the, the service industry is there, probably from a welfare point of view, is to ask actually, is there still free entry? Is there, can they, or at some point, are they being captured? And are we going to get models that actually are capturing this entirely and they're extracting a huge amount of rents? But meanwhile, these are what we're observing, of course, lots of restrictions on what to do for people. People are trapped in, as Philip was referring to, in safe countries uh, with, few can, uh, with few opportunities. But it's very clear that what, um, what Tuesday is also mentioning, that you know, we can keep on having these borders and want to put on the friction in the movement of people, but as a sayers of countries that are going to be so awful and, and so bad, so what to do with it. But you know, we have the other side to it. Uh, you know, people, societies, they're not particularly nice people in general anywhere in the world, and they're protective of what they want. And uh, I'm very struck by, and indeed we've observed it, that diaspora communities start complaining about migration. Just look at the voting patterns in Brexit. It is very striking who ends up voting for Brexit from diaspora communities. Um, in the end, you know, look, as economists, and I think that's where I would want to end at, you know, we know all kinds of things. Uh, about all the awful things, but in the end it is, is that if we can create as economists and contribute to that and other opportunities for people where, wherever people are, 
uh, maybe we'll get a bit of convergence and a bit of reducing of the gaps and a bit of convergence in security and not just in some of the most basic human development outcomes. And um, while people may, some of these movements and tensions will not be there, I don't think uh, walls or barbed wire or indeed shoot to, pol to kill policies of Mauritania are not going to help you very much. Um, and I think I leave it with this and just I hope to see more research on it. I think it's worth doing. But thank you very much to the panelists. I think they did an amazing job. <laughs>